and the heathen like showing words, using words, repetitious words. And Jesus is talking like this to the Jews, the chosen people. He compares them to the hypocrites and the heathen. What do you mean, Jesus? I found an example of a hypocritical prayer in the Bible. Jesus told a parable of two people, a publican and a Pharisee, who went into the temple. And the Pharisee prayed like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, <laughs> extortioners, unjust, adulterous, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Me, myself, and I. This is the epitome of a hypocritical prayer. You know, you need to picture this man, this Pharisee was standing in God's temple and looking at God straight into his face and boasting to God, you know, God, I am not like any ordinary man. I am righteous. I fast. I give tithes. I sing in the choir at PIC. I am a deacon. I am a deaconess. I am an elder. I serve your church. I am a pastor. I am. But I am not like this tax collector. A hypocritical prayer is self-centered. It is self-exalting. It is self-righteous. It is judgmental. It ignores personal sins and exalts personal deeds. A hypocritical prayer is simply godless. There is no God. The only time there is God in the prayer of that man is at the beginning. God, the rest is about himself. And sad to say, some of us, if not all of us, are guilty of such prayers. If you had time to record yourself while praying, you'll be surprised to discover how much of yourself is in your prayer and how much of God is in your prayer. And that is what I have come to share with you this weekend. In the morning, we'll talk about the best prayer ever. And I, some one of my friends came to me, Pastor, tell me what is the best prayer ever. You wait and hear. I was surprised by that prayer, the best prayer ever. The best prayer ever is not a hypocritical prayer. The heathenish prayer, very interesting. I found an example, not done by the Jews, but done in Israel by heathen. It was during the time of Elijah and King Ahab and Jezebel. You remember Elijah went on Mount Carmel and he prayed. But before he prayed, he asked the prophets of Baal to pray. And the Bible says that they called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon. But... There was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. At noon they cried aloud and cut themselves as there was their custom with knives and lances. I want to think, would you think about this? This is an impressive scenery of people praying and cutting themselves with knives. Just imagine you come for midweek one day and you see the pastor and the elders cutting themselves with knives and praying. The Bible says that they cut themselves until the blood gushed out on them. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. 
no one paid attention. A heathenish prayer is self-mortifying. It is self-abasing. It is self-deceptive. It is unnecessarily wordy. It is intrinsically demonic. It is a godless prayer. And the Bible seems to say with Jesus that some believers had adopted the hiddenish prayer maybe because their hypocritical prayers didn't work. Some of us, we think that it's because we will talk longer that God will answer us faster. Knees for Jesus. Sometimes I... I sit in church and I hear some prayers. I get very, very disturbed. Some prayers looks like, look like dissertations. Some prayers look like essay, well-written essay. There is introduction. Come on. And then there is conclusion. There are supporting evidences. You hear them praying with a loud voice and a tone, a melodious tone. Oh, God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, you who created the heavens and the earth, there is nothing. It is empty but full of words. How do you pray, my friend? Like a hypocrite or like a heathen? When... Did Jesus pray? Now you've seen how Jesus says we should not pray. And the Spirit led me to consider the prayers that Jesus did and that are recorded in the Gospels. Now there are so many, I just tried to, to find a few. So to give us a gist of how Jesus prayed and what we can learn from the life of prayer of Jesus. By the way, if you want to be a good praying person, pray like Jesus. Learn to pray like Jesus. Study the prayer life of Jesus. Jesus prayed when dealing with his mission. In Matthew 4, 1, you know the passage, the Bible says that Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted. But that time he was considering his upcoming mission. So he spent 40 days praying and fasting. Later on you will see him on the Mount of Transfiguration. When he was reviewing his mission, he was reviewing his mission. He went to the Mount and he was transfigured. And then at Gethsemane, when he was about to fulfill his mission, he went and prayed again. Jesus prayed when dealing with his mission. Do you know your mission on earth? Do you know why you exist? Because if you don't know why you exist, then you cannot pray like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Many of us, we live lives that are purposeless. We think that we've come to this world to earn a degree, to get a spouse, to have babies, to have certificates, and a car, and a mansion, and that's it. We are born to this earth to serve the living God, and we must know why we live. The reason why most of our prayers seem so futile, so empty, is because they are not connected to our mission. Do you know your mission? Secondly, Jesus prayed when ministering to the needy. I took the example of Mark 10, 16, when they brought children to him and the disciples says, hey, don't come here, folks. But Jesus says, that, that the little ones come to me and he prayed, he blessed them. And by the way, I hope you know that he prayed when he multiplied the bread and the fish. He prayed for the people. He prayed as he ministered to the people. Do you know your ministry? Is your prayer connected to your service to the needy? When you pray, you pray for yourself. Some of us, we have never prayed for anyone else than ourselves. Some of us, 
we used to pray for others sometime in the past. Some of us, we are planning to stop praying for our roommate because we, it's, the, the case seems hopeless. We are planning to stop praying for the people we are interceding for. We are planning to stop praying for our spouses and our children. This should not be. We should connect our prayer to the ministry for the needy. When did Jesus pray? Before facing his daily challenges. In Mark 1.35, the Bible says that Jesus woke up very early in the morning. For some people, early means 8 a.m. But the Bible says that Jesus woke up before the sun came out and he was somewhere in a secluded place praying to his father, asking his father to give him strength and power to face the new day victoriously. By the way, Moses in Psalm 90 says, God, fill us every morning with your mercy so we can be triumphant throughout our days. In other words, if I want to be victorious on Monday, I have to win the victory on Monday morning on my knees. Some of us, we just walk out of our rooms because we have class. We have assignments. We have deadlines. We are tired. We don't have time. We have time for so many things. We have time to comment on a boxing match or game. We don't have time to talk and to pray. We have time to talk about basketball. We don't have time to talk to Jesus. We have time to watch telenovelas. We don't have time to pray. And that is one reason why your life is so miserable every day. Because you set off every morning with no power. And then Satan is ready for you throughout the day. And he overpowers you. And then you come in the evening, you cry, Lord, why me? God says, when you wake up like Jesus, take time with me. Take time with me. When did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed before selecting his 12 apostles. I don't know if you know the story. When Jesus called the 12, before he called them, he prayed all night. And in the morning, he called. He selected 12 after, out of many. Because his father told him, pick Simon, pick James, pick John. Now let me bring it down to us. Have you ever prayed before choosing your friends? Hello? Have you ever prayed before choosing a class, your classmates? Have you ever asked God, Lord, I'm going to AUP. I will be living in a dormitory. Please give me good roommates. Who will make me stronger in the faith? Have you thought of praying about that? Have you ever prayed? I know this one, most of us will qualify for a life partner. Have you prayed for that? Do you pray for the people, for God to give you people that you will work with, or live with, or stay with before you meet them? Jesus did that. He prayed before selecting the 12. When did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed after experiencing success in ministry. There were times when Jesus multiplied bread and fish, and at a point the people said, hey, this is our king, we have to enthrone him, and there was excitement. When Jesus saw the excitement and he remembered his mission was not to be an earthly king, he saw the frenzy because of the success in his ministry. He told the disciples all the time, please move on, cross the lake. And he dismissed the multitude. And before anything else, the Bible says that he secluded himself to pray. What do you do when you succeed in life? 
do you pray? What do you do when you finally get that A for that course? Do you pray to God or do you praise yourself? Hello? What do you do when that girl you've been courting for so long finally says yes? Do you pray? Or do you run to your friends and celebrate your capabilities? What do you do when finally you get that degree? You've been suffering for four years. Do you pray? What do you do, pastor, after you preach a wonderful sermon and the church member says, wonderful pastor, that's amazing. Do you say, oh, thank you. Or do you pray to God, Father, may all the glory be given to you alone. What do you do when you succeed? What you do when you succeed will tell you how prayerful you are, how connected to Jesus you are. When did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed after fulfilling his given mission. In John 17, he's recorded praying a long prayer, praying for the apostles, praying for the church. In the time, he says, Lord, Father, I have glorified your name on earth. I have accomplished my mission. How would you pray like that if you don't know your mission? When did Jesus pray? After fulfilling his given mission. I would like to share with you seven lessons, very simple, that you can carry with you for the rest of your journey. Lesson number one, prayer is neither person discriminative nor place selective nor purpose free. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you are tall or short, black or white, fat or thin, it doesn't matter where you are in the dormitory, at home, on the street. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you can pray anywhere, anytime, provided you know your purpose. Lesson number two. Prayer is an attitude of the heart that purpose is to reveal the glory of God. Too many times we pray because we want to be seen like the Pharisees. We want our glory to be seen. And sometimes when they ask us to pray here, we kneel down and we become so holy. And we, 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 we change the tone of our voice as if it is the tone. It is not about the tone, it's about the heart. In my language, Filipino, we call heart puso. It's the heart. What is in your heart? And let me tell you this. If you want to have a powerful prayer life, you must learn how to talk to God simply. Simply. Don't beautify your words. Just say it as it is. Father, I am hurting. And to the guys who are listening to me, when you pray, go on your knees. Don't say, Father, forgive my sins. Say, Father, I looked at this girl today. Hello? Hello? Tell him as it is. You will feel that power working in you. Lesson number three. Prayer is not only about what God can do for you, but also about what God can do in you and through you. Most of us, we limit ourselves to what God does for us when we pray. So we keep on asking things for us. We want to pass that exam for ourselves. We want that boy to love us. We want that girl to love us. We want that professor to pass us. We want the administration to promote us. We keep on asking and asking, which is not wrong. But if it is only about us and for us, then our prayer life is handicapped. The prayer that I'm talking about, the prayer that is in the Bible, is not limited to what God does for you, but what God does in you and what he does through you. 
Come in the morning and you'll get more practical examples of these. Lesson number four. Prayer is the key that unlocks a victorious life in Jesus. Peter failed because he failed to pray. Jesus said, pray that you will not enter into temptation. Some of us, we pray when we are in temptation already. I remember this young man. He made arrangement with a girl. They were supposed to meet on the next day at a certain time, 1 p.m., somewhere. And he knew within himself that he, if he went there to visit that girl at that time, he knew he would sin. So before going to bed, he knelt down and said, Father, if it is not your will, please give me strength. Don't allow me to go there tomorrow. And he slept. Early in the morning, he knelt down and prayed, Father, you know, if it is under your will that I go to visit that girl, you know, if I go there, I will do this, 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 please. Father, let it not happen. The appointment is at 1 p.m. 10 a.m. Father, please, if it is not your will. He is ironing his clothes. 11. Father, please, if it is not your will, not allow me to go there. He is taking a shower. Twelve, Father, please, if he doesn't will, he's wearing his clothes. Twelve, fifteen, at the door of the house, Father, if it is not your will that I go there, when I walk out of the house, let my foot hit a stone. When he walks out, his foot hits a huge rock. And then he said, okay, he crosses the street and stands by the street and says, Father, after three jeepneys, I will know this is not your will. Ten jeepneys later, he stops a taxi. What is this man's, young man's problem? In his heart, he had already decided to do it. No amount of prayer will work you out of sin when your heart has already sinned. If you want to live a victorious life in Jesus, you must learn how to pray before temptation, not in temptation. Lesson number five. True prayer is a statement of connection and dependence on God, of distrust and denial of self, and of disconnection and independence from Satan. In other words, when we pray, when we go on our knees, when we have knees for Jesus, we are saying that we distrust ourselves, we are saying that we are disconnected from Satan, and we are saying that we are connected to God. Prayer is a statement. The moment you kneel, the moment you close your eyes, the moment you set your eyes and your heart on Christ, you are connecting to Christ and disconnecting to self and Satan. Lesson number six. Prayer is about receiving divine empowerment to fulfill our divinely appointed purpose by the grace and for the glory of God. Throughout this weekend, I want you to journey with me to a powerful experience of prayer. And in the morning, the best prayer ever will surprise you. You see, this statement is saying that prayer is not about us. It is about God living in us to fulfill His will through us. That is prayer. And millions of Christians do not reach this level of prayer. I said level of prayer. I use the word level because prayer has levels. 
Yes, when you are a new Christian, you are a babe, you pray certain ways, we understand. But after 10 years, if you pray the same way as when you were baptized, there is a problem. You have to go deeper and deeper and have a deeper knowledge and relationship with your God. Finally, lesson number seven, prayer is completely dependent upon the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Most of our prayers are not answered because the Holy Spirit is not involved. When the Holy Spirit is not there, the prayer is hypocritical or heathenish. But when the Spirit comes in, I can tell you stories, stories upon stories of how God has answered prayers of the church, my own prayers for people who were sick, who got cancer. One time, even I was a church pastor, they, they gave me a dead baby. I prayed the baby came back to life. God can do that, and I'm okay with it, but that is not the main purpose of prayer. If that's your purpose for prayer, to see miracles, to see wonders, to see the Red Sea parted, to see manna falling from heaven, then you are at a very low level of prayer. If your prayer, your main prayer, is still to pass an exam, is still to, mm, let me say, ask for food, is still to, what else, look for a life partner, which are legitimate prayer requests. But if that is your level of prayer, you have a long way to go. Because there are deeper issues in this world that we have to handle. Maybe you are not aware that the world that Satan is preparing for you folks is not a friendly world. A time is coming. It will be very difficult even to mention that you are a Christian. Talk less about praying. Just mentioning in public that you are a Christian. You read the news. It is ridicule today to be a Christian. It is ridicule to pray. And you think that praying for spouse... Praying for exam is preparing you for that world. Come on. There are deeper issues coming ahead of us. Are you getting ready? So when should I pray? When I'm happy? When I'm hurting? When I'm hungry? When I'm hesitant? When I'm helping? When I'm handling the Lord's business? And I do this in Christ. In other words, like Jesus, pray without ceasing. Prayer should become a reflex. Whether I'm walking down the street in AUP, or I'm boarding the jeepney to Balibago, or I'm going to class, I'm waking up in the morning. I am serving a fellow brother, a fellow sister. I am going to church. I am about to face an accident. I need to learn how to pray without ceasing. So may God help us. May God help us experience prayer like Jesus. May God bless his word. Amen.